Hello there. I am the Lifted Starfish, and I like Frozen 2. I think Frozen 2 is an amazing movie, better than the first one even. However, Nicholas here seems to disagree. Not only does he think the movie is terrible, he also believes those who claim otherwise are lying. So I've decided to make a response, tearing his video apart. Before we get into that though, I want to let everybody know that I have a channel on both Library and BitChute where I also post my videos. This is because I believe that YouTube, being the only viable web video hosting platform, needs competition. They essentially have a monopoly over the web video hosting entertainment industry, and I think the lack of competition is the main reason for the past four years of drama on the platform. So if you agree, I encourage you to watch this video on either of those other platforms. Links in the description. Now, let's jump into this dumpster fire. Animated movies are an incredible medium. I agree. I think animation allows for a wonderful amount of creative freedom that doesn't exist in traditional live-action filmmaking. Though realistic CGI is making that gap smaller and smaller, there is still a place for wholly animated films. I say this all the time. I can get this tattooed on my chest. Oh. Okay, then. Don't you think that's a bit much, though? I know that if I brought a guy home and started getting their clothes off to, you know, do the dirty, I'd find it a little weird if he had a tattoo across his chest that said, Animated movies are an incredible medium. I mean, I'd probably still fuck them, but that'd just kind of be there in the back of my mind. I mean, sure, go for it, but I personally think it's kind of weird. Animated movie sequels are even better! Not necessarily. When they're planned and the writer has a vision to continue from the start, and the sequel maintains the heart of the original, a sequel can often be just as good, if not better, than the original. However, if the sequel happens because the studio demands it, or because the artist became greedy, the sequel can be shallow and the writing can suffer. I'm not saying the producer shouldn't want money from the art that they make, nor am I saying that it can't be the primary reason. But when the producer doesn't seem to care about the quality, the quality will suffer. And this doesn't just apply to animated movie sequels. This applies to all sequels. This is the perfect excuse to take an existing story and expand. An existing world and flesh it out even more. Existing characters and make them grow even better than they did before. Okay, that's true, but your phrasing implies you don't think that's also true for non-animated movies. Sequels aren't always just some random cash grab. You're correct. This is a perfect way to tell more of a story without spending too long on introductions and setups and finding out who this dude is. You don't need to do that in a sequel. That's also correct. But sadly, we live in a world of the greedy, the money-hungry, the lazy. Yes, we do. And unfortunately, when you can produce something profitable with no effort, it's not uncommon for a studio to encourage people to take that route, because the less effort you have to put into something, the more you can churn out in less time and thus make more money in general. Is this a good thing? That depends, but with art, it most certainly isn't. And I definitely hope studios will start to recognize that, what with people voting with their dollars. The Rise of Skywalker bombed for a reason. Game of Thrones last season didn't get those awful reviews for no reason. People were upset by the poor writing on display and threw a fit because that's what happens when you don't get what you pay for. You stop paying for it. They did this for my boys in Cars, my fam in The Incredibles, but for movies like Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, Toy Story, they furthered the stories and world and gave them even more emotion to the characters. While I agree with you that the examples you showed were sequels where the writers care just as much as they did in the first installment, that doesn't mean they weren't made out of greed. If Shrek the Third shows anything, it's that DreamWorks definitely cared more about the money to be made from the sequel than the actual art. Enough so that they hired two new writers that clearly didn't care as much. Also, what do you mean by they gave more emotion to the characters? Do you mean that the characters went through a wider range of emotions? I don't think that Shrek necessarily goes through more emotions in the second than the first. You could be saying that they add more depth to the characters, but even in Shrek 2, I would disagree with that. I don't think that they necessarily add anything to the characters. Most of what we see in Shrek 2 regarding character behavior is a logical progression of what's already shown about the characters at the end of the first film. I think that the characters are just as deep, it's just that now they're in a new situation and we get to see how they respond. And none of those responses are necessarily something that couldn't be predicted by someone who understands the characters well enough. As for fleshing out the world, I don't think anybody would argue with you that it wasn't done in Trek 2 or How to Train Your Dragon 2. But, uh, yo, Frozen? Nah, 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 sorry guys. Um, okay then. Care to back that up? Let it go? More like, let me sleep? This movie is as boring as watching Ice Freeze. Mate, I can't speak for other people, but your humor is pretty shit. I'll be the first one to admit it that I really bumped to the original Frozen. No you aren't. 
many people, myself included, found themselves unashamedly humming or singing the songs, not because they were just earworms, but because they were good songs. Not that you disagree with that, but you're definitely not the first to admit it. I have so much fun with it. I find Olaf adorable. I find the songs fun and heartwarming. While it's weak in plot, I mean, at least it has one, though. Okay, Frozen's plot isn't weak, but to say that Frozen 2's plot doesn't exist is a bold claim, and I'm gonna need you to back that up. The movie from the first watch was a fun Disney-centric tale. Disney-centric tale? What does that mean? Its source material can be loosely called so, so much that Frozen itself departed from the adaptation label altogether, instead being inspired by the Ice Queen, despite sharing the name in several localizations. You're going to need to explain what you mean by that. It had wonder and genuine feelings of magic and adventure at times. Genuine feelings of magic and adventure. What does that even mean? What is a feeling of magic? There's definitely magic in the movie, and I'd be hard-pressed to argue that Anna and Kristoff don't go on an adventure in this film, though this feels like a setup to imply that you don't believe the movie's sequel has the same qualities. I bump love as an open door daily. I scream that tune at my girlfriend's face every day. I'm amazed she's still with you, if that's the case. But to each their own, I guess. But all of these feelings, this wonder and excitement, this cheesiness and hilariosity, it's all lost in Frozen 2. Okay, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure hilariosity isn't a word, I fundamentally disagree with that statement. But as stated previously, I'm willing to hear your argument as long as you're willing to make one. It'll have to be pretty compelling, though. <coughs> Frozen 2 is too cold. Frozen 2 is too late. Frozen 2 is too hot. Too Frozen too hot. Too many shitty fucking puns. Get on with it. It's a boring cold movie is what I'm trying to say. Okay, but whether or not something is boring is subjective. You'll need to identify something that the vast majority of people agree tends to make something boring. Like Kristoff doing his taxes. It angers me. I wanted this to be fun, cute, adorable. I wanted a new tale that slapped in this world. Okay, you just said a lot of things, and I'm going to preemptively declare that this video is flat out wrong. Frozen 2 is not bad, and those who disagree with Nick are not lying. This statement right here is essentially the core of Nick's argument. He says two important things. First, that it angers him, and second, that he wanted the movie to be fun. It's clear that he's angry because the movie wasn't fun, and that's why he decided to make the video. I encourage you to watch the video on its own without my rambling interspersed throughout it. It's very clear that the video is essentially him venting about the film because it's not what he wanted. And no, that's not me putting words in his mouth. He literally said that he wanted the movie to be fun. Nick is clearly conflating funness with goodness, which is not the case. I'm sure many will agree with me when I say that Joker was a phenomenal film, absolutely spectacular. I'm sure those same people will also agree with me when I say that Joker was absolutely not a fun movie. I'm being honest, like, I seriously wanted a good Frozen movie. I wanted this to be an adorable story, but I found absolutely none of that walking into the theater. Well, of course not. You have to actually see the movie after you walk in. In all seriousness, though, you found none of that? I thought Olaf growing up was pretty cute, as was Kristoff's little Missing You song, though I did cringe at it on the first watch. I am a Disney shill. I live in Disney World. I eat, breathe, sleep this fat loser mouse. I rub his tail for good luck and pray to his creator. Disney is my lifeblood. I saw this movie in a Disney movie theater, and I could say, this movie sucks. Okay, setting aside all of that mess you just described and not taking it literally for the sake of a joke I can't be bothered to put effort into making, well, I'm glad that you can set aside your shill bias to criticize something that you believe has poor quality, I hope you can understand that being an unbiased, shameless shill for a corporation is not a good thing. I hate Bob Iger, and I'm sure many others do. Sure, he's part of the reason we have the MCU, but he's also the reason we have the sequel trilogy and the live-action Renaissance remakes. Disney have essentially become god of the entertainment industry, and any economist will tell you that monopolies are anything but good for the economy. And all of you need to stop lying to yourselves. This right here. Give me a moment while I cover my ass. He literally just said, all of you need to stop lying to yourselves. This statement implies that he believes there is an objective metric by which the film can be judged, and that, according to this metric, the film is bad, and that the people who believe the film is good are lying to themselves. So anybody who wants to come after me and say, dude, it's just his opinion, no. He said it himself that he thinks anybody who thinks the film is good is a liar. This isn't just his subjective opinion, he thinks that the film is bad as an objective judgment. Frozen 2 is like Aladdin 2, except a massive budget on the big screen. 
Okay, that's an interesting comparison. I've never seen Aladdin 2, but if you can provide examples for why you think that it's an apt comparison, I will give you the charity of assuming you aren't being disingenuous. It's a pointless, forgettable sequel with zero plot. Um, quantify that please? Don't get me wrong, the film has its issues, the pacing is kind of oof, and the lack of an antagonist can make things confusing. I definitely struggle to figure out which of the four antagonist types the film is going for. I think there's a pretty clear example of versus self scheme going on with Elsa and maybe a little bit with Anna, but then there's the whole versus nature thing with the elementals eating Arendelle. But then there's the whole issue of Granddaddy over here being the reason the elementals started eating Arendelle, so is it versus adversary? That's another issue, but aside from those two things, I think the film does have a plot that you can easily understand. It's about Elsa finding herself. There's also an overarching theme of belonging that I'll get more into later. Regardless, to say there's no plot is demonstrably wrong. And it honestly breaks my heart. It wouldn't be nitpicking to break down every major and minor plot point in this movie and say literally none of them make any sense. Well, yeah, Nick. A nitpick is something valid but small enough that it is inconsequential. An example of a nitpick would be the car in the background of Fellowship. Sure, it's a problem. But the vast majority of people didn't even notice it, and is something that clearly was an accident. So you're right. If none of the plot points in a movie make any sense, then it's not nitpicking because it literally causes the movie to make no sense. None of the characters act like they did in the first movie. They barely even talk to each other. Depends on what you mean when you say that none of the characters act like they do. Are you saying that they don't act like they did at the beginning or the middle of the first movie? Of course not. The end of the film kind of marked some character development for at least a few of them. There's also the idea of time passing. It's been three years since the first movie. That's why Olaf acts so different. Then you have Anna and Kristoff. Kristoff is featured far less in this movie, but the few scenes he's in, he's shown to have a one-track mind. Which makes sense, since that's really the only thing that matters about him in this film. Anna and Elsa are close again, and that's due to them reconciling at the end of the first movie. So sure, none of the characters might act exactly as they did in Frozen, but that's because of the events of that movie. Either that, or the simple passage of time and aging for Olaf. As for them not really talking to each other, that's irrelevant. You can have a movie where none of the characters communicate with one another, and it can still be good. Not that it won't be a challenge, but I believe it could be done. It's actually kind of insane that this movie is nearly two hours long, and it feels like the main characters talked like seven times at most. Okay, if you're going to make a video like this, try to make your points clearer. I can't tell what you mean by talked maybe seven times at most. Do you mean that they only talked at all seven times? Because that's demonstrably false. Do you mean that they only spoke to one another seven times? That's also demonstrably false. But none of that matters because even if you were right, that's not an argument. I can't remember anything of substantial value being said by anyone. Um, did you watch the movie? I think Kristoff wanting to marry Anna is pretty substantial as an aspiration. Olaf being older but not old enough is pretty significant. It seems that Anna said she was really almost only living for the sake of her sister. Seriously, that's a dark song. How do I rise from the floor when it's not you I'm rising for? It's like, well, guess if you ain't around, I'ma just ultimate yeet myself. Bye. There's also the part where we learn that their mother is Atahalan or Northoldra or whatever they're called. Their father gives them the exposition story, Elsa straight up lies to her sister and then yeets her away with Olaf. Olaf experiences anger for the first time. Sure, not a lot is said in the film, but what of substantial value is said in the film? I'd argue that there's more valuable dialogue in this film than the first. Though what we classify as valuable seems a little vague and arbitrary. Except like a line from the main song, Into the unknown! Ah! Into the unknown! I mean, the song slaps, but it's all the movie has. Okay, if you're saying that Into the Unknown is all that the movie has that's good, then you yourself disagree with that immediately in the next section. Now, if you're saying that you think it's all the movie has in terms of meaningful dialogue, monologue, unilogue, whatever log speech, then you're also wrong. There is an ongoing theme throughout the film of feeling that you have to live or exist for the sake of something or someone else. Holden on Tight sort of touches on this, and Into the Unknown does as well but it really hits hard when Lost in the Wood and Next Right Thing show up. Both songs are sort of how the singers feel lost and directionless without the person that they held on to most, which is part of why Holding On Tight was essentially a setup song. Show Yourself takes it a step further. In the song, we watch as Elsa learns that she doesn't need to live for anybody but herself. 
her mother literally says, you are the one you've been waiting for. And Elsa finishes it with all of my life. And this is just the music. I already mentioned other valuable stuff that was said previously, so I won't go over it again. But this is just flat out wrong. First, let me start by listing things I found good in the movie. They are few and far between, but you know, they exist and we gotta make that clear. Oh, thank God. Wouldn't want you to be disingenuous. The animation. Oh, golly, is the animation pretty? Did you just say, oh, golly? I hope you realize that when you say that, nobody is taking you seriously. When you use the word golly, it sounds like you're mocking the people who actually agree with the follow-up statement. You zoom in on Elsa's dress and you can see the individual patterns and it's so nice. You zoom in on Kristoff's nose and you can see every pore on that fat nose. Salamander dude, they add a cute little salamander type Pokemon fire dude and he's so cute. He's adorable. Kristoff's boy band S song where he sings overly dramatic and hilarious. It's, it's funny. It's fun. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I like about the movie. Okay, that's wonderful and all, but where's the good stuff? It's great that you like all this stuff, and I agree, I think the animation is stellar. And some of the effects are really cool, but that's really the only objective thing, and the cool part is subjective. Salamander Dude is cute, and I agree that Kristoff's song slaps, as you would put it. But both of those are subjective. And even those very things come with issues. First off, let's talk about the teaser trailer for Frozen 2. Okay, I'm gonna just say that I actually didn't see any of the promotional material for this film before it came out, so I don't really have anything to say regarding that the very first released footage of this movie. That little teaser where we see Elsa like fighting the ocean, it's like this really powerful, emotional teaser. Everyone was like, ooh, ah, yo, the water's gorgeous. Where's Elsa? Why is she there? Yo, what's happening? Is she okay? What is she fighting? Is she fighting to get stronger? Dude, I'm so intrigued. What's gonna happen? Oh my God. Well, that tiny little teaser is literally just two minutes in the movie with zero emotional weight or power behind it. I was like waiting the entire movie for <laughs> for that scene to see what they would do with this scene like it'll show us Elsa overcoming something deep inside her something she needs to do okay for those of you who haven't seen the movie this is a scene in which she has to get across the water I believe she's trying to head north to a place where she'll find the meaning or the reason for her powers this scene is her trying to cross the water to do so the issue is that in order to do so she needs to cross the territory of a Norse water spirit called a Nok they're very territorial and will attempt to drown you if you enter their domain the only way to survive is to either escape or mount the spirit. Elsa opted for the latter, creating some rains with her ice powers. By the way, I think Elsa's powers are insanely overpowered. She can straight up make fabric out of ice? How the fuck does that work? And rains? Like, aren't those made of leather? How the fuck, Elsa? You must be making some sort of weird, intricate ice weave, because that ain't how ice works. Regardless, I think crossing the ocean to find out why you have your powers, something her parents died to find out, would be a little emotional. There's also the whole risk of death thing. But no, it just ended up being insanely normal and anticlimactic. Normal and anticlimactic? Have you ever seen a movie? Sure, it's not endgame level climax, but it's still a climax. We've talked about this before. She has to fight a water spirit to get across the ocean to find out where her powers came from, which her parents died for. Her parents died for this, Nick! And that spirit is probably what killed them! Jesus fucking Christ, Nick! And anticlimactic is a word that you can use to describe the entirety of this movie. There are no stakes, no problems, no threats in the whole movie. Jesus Christ, Nick, why are you so disingenuous? I've seen some of your other content before and you're usually not this bad, but fuck. <sighs> I've already demonstrated why he's wrong about this. Every time someone has an issue, it's solved. Instantly. Barely any dialogue or struggle. They literally fix every issue like it was nothing. Instantly? Like it was nothing? What the fuck does that mean? What about the inciting incident? You know, the thing that caused the plot of the whole fucking movie? The part we talked about before where Elsa had to cross the sea and almost died? What about that part? Without spoiling too much, the main plot of Frozen 2 is that Elsa gets like a call from the forest, but it's a magical forest, but the forest is cursed, and they gotta find a way to free the forest and whatever's wrong with it. Okay, no. That is extremely reductive. They have to go to the forest because Arendelle is all fucked up by elemental spirits, and if they don't go to the forest to solve whatever problem is happening there, her people won't have a place to fucking live. 
Along the way, you meet a couple new characters, all of who seem insanely interesting. Every new character actually seems fun, and you want to know more about them individually, yet you never see them again for the entire movie. Two characters specifically are introduced, given names and purposes, and it just seems like they will be important, but they just aren't. They just disappear. Literally, the entire movie onwards. It's like, did they even exist in the first place? I have no idea. Okay, well I can agree that I probably would have enjoyed a bit more screen time and development from Matthias and Yelena, I don't know how to pronounce their fucking name, it probably would have taken time away from the characters we were trying to focus on. But regardless, that's not objective. Plus, I'm not convinced you would have given it to the movie if they did have more screen time. I'm convinced that if they'd gotten more screen time, you would have complained about how they dedicated too much time to two characters we didn't give a shit about. Also, both characters do appear later in the movie. Matias helps with getting the giants to take out the dam, and sure, it would have also been nice to see more of Yelena, but at least by the end of the movie we can see that she and Matias share some mutual respect. It honestly makes no sense. The movie starts off really strong with this interesting new story to take place. They give a great reason to be back in this world at first. Everything soon starts to fall apart when it feels like they just didn't bother to care anymore in writing. They basically give their heart and soul to the first 15 minutes of this movie, and then it seriously feels like the writers just gave up. Like they were like, oh god, I gotta, I gotta finish this movie? Oh jeez. I think in order to give a real rhyme or reason to why this movie broke my heart, I need to dive into spoilers. Oh thank fuck, maybe we'll actually get some evidence now. So if you want to watch this movie blindly for some reason, run away, freeze yourself in time, just 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 get out of here. Okay, so let's get into the dumb stuff. The truly dumb stuff. Olaf, Olaf, you dumb buffoon. This man dies for just three minutes in the most forced, boring way possible. Okay, I can understand the argument to be made for Olaf's death and subsequent revival being cheap. Though I'd argue that it sort of works because it allows one of the most meaningful songs in the movie. Next Right Thing. Next Right Thing is kind of this movie's version of Greatest Teacher Failure is, but not as patronizing or dumb. I've stated before the theme of Frozen 2 is feeling like you need somebody or something else to live for, and for Anna, Elsa very much was that thing. Olaf's death serves as a medium through which Anna learns about Elsa's death, because that's the only logical explanation for her magic wearing off, seeing as it never been an issue before. It's also what motivates Anna to eventually resolve the overall conflict. She sees Elsa's death as a consequence for what's happened, and the only way to prevent even more suffering is to right the wrong that's been done. Now, do I think that killing Olaf was the best way to go about doing that? No, not really, but I won't say it was outright bad. All because of Elsa. Elsa's main mission in this movie is to find out what is calling her, and she finds it very easily. Turns out it's just three miles away from her country or something? The land makes no sense. No part about frozen land makes any sense. Everything is next to each other. There's no journey or far venturing. Okay, so a couple things here. In the film, it's explained that these are essentially neighboring kingdoms, even though North Older aren't technically a kingdom, and the king believed that their shamanism was evil, which is why he built the dam. These kingdoms are next to one another because if they weren't, the catalyst, Grandad being a royal prick, would never have happened. And even if you were right about the lack of journey, that doesn't matter. Twelve Angry Men is widely regarded as one of the greatest movies ever made, and it essentially takes place in one room. You don't need a journey for a movie to be good. I really hate to say this, as it's not really an argument, but it seems like you weren't a fan of the movie because it just wasn't what you wanted or expected. When Elsa needs to go into this cave because she hears a voice, like it's supposed to be a long journey away, it's literally a three minute horse ride on top of the water. How small is this world? It, it's really small! I literally just explained why it doesn't matter that the journey isn't very long. Okay, so when Elsa gets in this cave, she finds out this world has more powers. There's like spirits and stuff all around, like fire and earth and other avatar stuff. And at the center of all of it is snow. Snow is at the center of these elements. Snow, a byproduct of water, one of the elements. Snow binds them all together. Snow? Why? What? That's so stupid. Snow is literally the element that binds fire and earth and wa water. What? Snow is literally water. Snow is just water! What? You fucking moron. No. She is at the center. Not Snow, you dumb fuck. She is the fifth binding element. Lilo Dallas Multipass. It just so happens that she has ice powers. Why specifically it's ice is not explained. 
and is something I believe will be explained in the third movie, or maybe it won't, and she'll just get a fire girlfriend because reasons. But regardless, no, Snow is not what binds them together. She is. So when she finds all of this information out, this whatever information this is, she freezes, and this causes Olaf to die, leading for Anna to start singing the most depressing Evanescent song ever. Yeah, Nick. Her sister just died, Nick. She's dead. Wouldn't you be more than a little upset if you essentially watched your sister die? This movie is emo, dude. This movie is depressing, and a lot of people like to say that this is good. And I disagree with that. I don't think that just because a movie is emo and depressing that it's good. There are plenty of good, lighthearted, fun, happy movies where everybody is okay and no one suffers. However, I will say that I appreciate the more complicated, serious ideas that the film discusses. And no, the film doesn't literally discuss it, but I've said before that I think this movie addresses some things that should be addressed. I haven't mentioned it until now, but my family is full of mental illness, and while I've not had any myself, that I know of, included in those mental illnesses that those close to me have to deal with, are depression and anxiety, which this film very much resonates with. And no, I will not pretend that this didn't affect my enjoyment of the movie. As a matter of fact, I didn't think much of the movie when I first saw it. I didn't think it was bad, though, just boring. It was only after my sister and partner expressed why the film resonated with them so much that I began to enjoy and appreciate the film more. No, I don't think being adult, boring, emo, and depressing are good. If you make a film dark and depressing just for the sake of it, I would go as far as to call it disrespectful. But this film doesn't do that. It's dark and depressing because it's covering topics that people with depression and anxiety have to deal with. Specifically, feeling like you don't belong, and what you'll do once those you thought you lived for are gone. This is adult. There are adult themes and emotions in this movie, and no, that's, that's really not it. It's all insanely forced drama that isn't fun. God damn it, Nick! I don't give a shit how much fun you didn't have with the movie. The only drama I would consider forced is Kristoff trying to propose and Anna completely misunderstanding it. I think Anna's cluelessness is very out of place and jarring, but aside from that, I think most of the drama is fairly natural. Who wants to watch people be sad for an hour and 30 minutes without any sense of wonder and adventure? A lot of people, Nick. And just because those people aren't you doesn't mean the movie is bad. The lack of wonder and adventure doesn't fucking matter. The fact that it's not fun doesn't fucking matter. And the fact that you think so very much communicates that you don't have the first clue as to what makes something objectively good or not. There's no sense of learning or lessons coming from these air quote adult themes. Did you watch the fucking movie? In Show Yourself, Elsa's mother very clearly says, You are the one you've been looking for. And Elsa responds in understanding, saying, All of my life. So I don't know what the fuck you mean by no sense of learning. It's all surface level dark boringness. It's just really just forced emotions. Her sister is dead, Nick! So in order for Anna to save Elsa and Olaf, I guess, she needs to destroy a bridge, right? I'm saying I'm saying bridge because the other world is demonetizable. You learn halfway through this movie that this bridge here, it's an evil bridge. It's real it's a really evil bridge. The bridge was built in the past by Elsa and Anna's grandpa. It turns out grandpa was a bad boy and he built a bridge in this forest to mess with people and prank them. That is extremely reductive. The purpose of the dam was to destroy the forest and starve the North Ultra. And for some reason, this bridge has been causing all the spirits there to be whack and upset, and there's like spooky fog. And so, at the end of the movie, Anna gets these big rock dudes to break the bridge, because breaking it will fix everything. At this point in the film, Anna doesn't know that destroying the dam will bring back her sister. As far as she knows, Elsa is dead, and she just needs to do the next right thing. God fucking damn it, did you listen to the fucking song? She leaves them there to break it, but no, there's a soldier guy who's like, wait, no, don't do that. You can't do this. This is bad. That soldier guy is Matthias, the guy you said was so interesting earlier in the movie that we didn't see any more of. And she's like, but I have to. And he's like, oh, okay. No, she doesn't just say that she has to. She literally tells Matthias that her sister, Elsa, died for this, which, by the way, makes Anna the de facto queen. So he kind of gets to listen to her now. Th that's literally what happens. He puts up a fight for three seconds. So why was it even in the movie? This happened so that nobody asked, why didn't anyone try to stop them from destroying the dam? Also, why didn't the rock dudes break the bridge from the start? You're telling me this bridge was the reason that the force was all whack and the things in the force big enough to fix it just didn't? 
For 34 years, they straight up didn't. It's your own fault at that point. What is wrong with you? Holy fuck, a good argument. In all seriousness, no, this is actually a good point. Why didn't they destroy the dam? But so far, it's my only glaring issue with the film. Okay, so the bridge breaks and a massive flood heads towards Arendelle. This entire thing that we were warned about from the start of the movie, we were warned that if this bridge breaks, it'll destroy Arendelle. Arendelle will be gone. But when the flood comes towards Arendelle, Elsa is unfrozen. She gets to town instantly like she teleports and she saves the town with no struggle, zero struggle. She shows up, breathes underwater with some ice powers and everything is saved in less than two minutes. I actually also agree with this. I think Elsa was way too fast, and for thematic reasons, I think it would have made a lot more sense for Arendelle to be destroyed. It was disgustingly anticlimactic, and just begs the question, why did we even care in the first place? Why was there any sense of tension? Like, we should have cared that this was going to be a big struggle. Number one, they cared because the city was still essentially uninhabitable. But also, I actually believe that Arendelle was going to be destroyed. But it wasn't! It literally wasn't! You had this entire sequence of Elsa finding out where her powers come from, a moment that is supposed to be a, like a wow factor, and like, whoa, crazy, that's where they come from? Oh man, that's insane! It also shows Elsa learning that she doesn't need to live for anyone but herself. And they just simply come from an empty cave? Somehow? No, they don't come from an empty fucking cave. They come from the elemental spirits there there was there was zero answer inside fire and water and stuff too were inside why didn't why didn't she get those powers or anyone else inherit those powers why just, just why 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 okay again why she didn't get any of those powers we don't know but why no one else inherited those powers is very much explained in the movie elsa being the firstborn was given powers as a reward to their mother for rescuing prince agnar who was on the enemy side and incapacitated. Also, where in the living reindeer did Kristoff go for the entire movie? Everyone noticed this. He's in the start of the movie wanting to propose to Anna, then he disappears because the movie has no writing for him, no other purpose. He's just gone. He doesn't disappear. We don't focus on him because he's not really relevant outside of him wanting to be with Anna. This movie angers me, man. It angers me for no reason. I literally am so pissed at this movie, it feels illegal. He spends like the next minute and a half repeating himself, and then he says this. A third movie could come out with a completely unrelated story, for all I care, because this story itself has no effect on anything at all. And if they do make a Frozen 3, I guarantee that anything from this movie will not have any effect on the characters in the future. Except for Horse and Salamander being an animal in the movie. That, that's about it. Literally, Elsa is no longer Queen of Arendelle, and now Anna is. Also, Anna and Kristoff are engaged, and it can be expected that the Northuldra and Arendelle will actually now be very close allies. This movie can literally be frozen in time, get it, and be erased from canon, and that'll be so fine, it's crazy. Poopy doopy frozen too, more like frozen poo. You're just, you're just a frozen doo-doo, dude. Well, that was a fucking dumpster fire. I've seen some of Nick's other content. He's usually not this bad. I'm not sure what happened with this video, but he dropped the ball really fucking hard. The main issue he seemed to have was basically he didn't enjoy the movie because the movie didn't resonate with him. And for some reason, he thought that that meant the movie was bad. It doesn't. I'm sure everyone can agree that Joker was not a happy or fun movie, but it was amazing. So I don't really have an outro because this is my first video, but... I would appreciate the standard stuff like comment, subscribe, and I know it's annoying to hear someone say that, but I say it because it works. I hope you'll return when I get around to making some other content. As stated at the beginning of the video, I also publish my content on BitChute and Library, and encourage you to check those out. Thank you for watching.